Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Bob Walker. I'm chair of the department. Uh, really thrilled to uh, introduce today's speakers. Actually, second week in a row, we have done a mixed uh, medicine and surgery uh, Grand Rounds, which I think speaks to the teamwork that's necessary to provide terrific care. We heard about it last week in the management of, uh, of obesity, and we'll hear about it today in the management of complex uh, lung disease and specifically the use of lung transplantation as a remarkable uh, tool to, uh, to manage people with, uh, with severe lung disease. So obviously people are aware that uh, lung transplant is a complex uh, procedure that has uh, enormous benefits but carries a lot of risks. <clears throat> there have been a lot of in, uh, innovations in transplantation and many of them uh, developed and implemented here at UCSF and virtually all of them have uh, come due to a uh, really wonderful partnership between uh, our surgical colleagues and folks in our, uh, our pulmonary critical care division, along with other, uh, other individuals, including infectious diseases and, and other parts of, of our enterprise. Uh, so we're going to hear from our uh, two experts in this area to talk about some of the advances in lung transplantation. Let me introduce them to you, and the presentations will be a tag team with uh, uh, Jasleen will go uh, first, then uh, then Steve, and then at the end uh, we'll come back on for questions and answers. Uh, Steve Hayes is Professor of Medicine and Medical Director of our Transplant Program in our uh, Pulmonary Critical Care Allergy and Sleep Medicine Division. He also directs Digital Health for the Transplant Program. Uh, he's a pulmonologist whose expertise is in caring for patients with end-stage lung disease, uh, including but not limited to patients who need transplantation. Uh, Steve earned his medical degree in, at the University of Kansas and residency uh, there. He was chief resident there, and then he made the move out west for a fellowship in pulmonary critical care at UCSF and a lung transplant fellowship at Stanford. Uh, Steve, welcome. And uh, uh, tag teaming with Steve will be uh, uh, Jasleen Kukreja, who is professor of surgery and surgical director of lung transplantation in the division of CT surgery uh, here. Uh, she also uh, directs UCSF's Adult Respiratory Mechanical Circulatory Support Program. Uh, Jasleen uh, is a uh, world-renowned uh, thoracic surgeon with a particular specialization in lung transplant and lung volume reduction uh, surgery, but also treats patients with lung cancer and esophageal cancer and other disorders that require thoracic surgery. Uh, Jasleen uh, shuttled back and forth between the East and West Coast. She did her medical school at UCLA. Uh, residency and surgery at the Brigham in Boston uh, uh, and in CT surgery here, then fellowship in general surgery uh, and thoracic surgery at the Brigham, uh, where she also uh, got an MPH from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And so both highly accomplished individuals who are really changing the, the world of transplantation. And uh, the talk today will be uh, entitled Climbing to New Heights in Lung Transplantation, Surgical and Medical Innovations to Improve Outcomes at UCSF. And let me hand it off, I believe, to Jasleen. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to share my screen real quick. So can everybody see it? Uh, yep, looks fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, Steve and I wanted to highlight uh, some of the accomplishments of our program. He and I might be the face of the program, but there's a whole village behind us. You know, I frequently tell my patients that once you become part of our program, uh, you're in it for the rest of your life till death do us apart. And I feel exactly the same way about our pulmonary colleagues that we are in it together for better or worse. Uh, so thank you so much for having us here. Um, we have no disclosures relevant to the current topic at hand today. So briefly, just the historical perspective, um, our lung transplant program was established in 1991 by our very uh, own Jeff Golden, along with uh, Fraser Keith, who was the surgeon these are, this is a picture from then, uh, two patients who underwent single lung transplant and uh, with Jeff at the bedside with uh, our coordinator, Celia, at that time. So fast forward to, to the last decade, 2010 um, was a year marked by a lot of um, um, big news items. Barack Obama became the president. There was the swine flu as opposed to the uh, pandemic we're facing now first woman director to get the Academy Award and, uh, and 
also iPad came. But for me personally, the most memorable thing was because I became the surgical director of lung transplant. It was a big, big responsibility for me. I was only five years out at that time. But more importantly, 2011 was even more remarkable. Tsunami occurred in Japan. Osama bin Laden was finally captured and killed. But there were also some positive highlights, royal wedding, and most importantly, we were able to recruit the best medical director in the country. Yay. Okay, since then, um, since 2010, 2011, our teams have grown significantly. Uh, we have now lucky number 13 transplant pulmonologists in our group and two and a half surgeons. Uh, the mix of surgeons has changed over time. Uh, whereas the pulmonary team has been pretty, pretty remarkably consistent, just added more and more people, which uh, has been fantastic. Uh, this is what our faculty looks like right now. Very diverse, very, um, very accomplished. This is our entire team of uh, uh, faculty, coordinators, APPs, etc. cetera. Uh, beautiful team village that we are very proud to be part of. Our program volumes have been increasing steadily by, I would say about 15 to 20% every year. I point the arrow, that's when Steve and I kind of uh, took over the, the running of the program in 2010, 2011, and it's been about, I would say about 15 to 20% increase. So the two things, I mean, this is obviously, you know, we have done a lot in this program, but for the sake of uh, time, today we, discuss, we decided that we're going to limit ourselves to a couple of things that we wanted to highlight. One was um, strategies for increasing access to transplant for our patients, and the other was to, to primarily talk about, uh, and these this will include both medical and surgical strategies for in, increasing access. And the second thing we wanted to talk about was how we can get more patients uh, transplanted. So focusing primarily on the, the donor pool. And then, then Steve is gonna talk about um, um, the outcomes as well as other innovative uh, things that are going on in terms of uh, digital monitoring. So. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Steve. Thanks, Jeslyn. Thanks for the introduction, Bob. Um, so lung transplant selection is one of the most important things that we do, really finding patients that are appropriate for transplant, that are going to get a benefit from transplant. And we had most recent guidelines published in 2021. Our very own Laurie Leard was the primary author of these guidelines. And these are important because they really identify what the risks are for patients um, who are undergoing transplant and what should we should be considering when we're looking at specific types of patients for transplant. And I say this because we see lots of, Jasmine, sorry, um, uh, forward one slide. I thought I was running it for a second. Um, and I say this because it, the straightforward candidate is, is kind of a rare item, especially at a place like UCSF where we have all these different subspecialty clinics, rheumatology, interstitial lung disease, infectious disease, et cetera. Systemic sclerosis or scleroderma was a disease that was a big problem for us in terms of being able to take care of them about 15 to 20 years ago. In fact, when Jeslyn and I were training, scleroderma was considered a pretty broad contraindication to lung transplantation because of its systemic nature and some of the issues that were um, you know, very common in this group, namely uh, gastrointestinal issues, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, gastroparesis, and the propensity to have aspiration were big problems. Um, and there were a lot of questions about how well these patients would do. Next slide. This kind of just highlights some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, these patients oftentimes have digital ulcerations, they have severe array nodes, they've got uh, skin thickening, and this can be problematic for wound healing and chronic infections. But the most perilous thing is really the esophageal dysmotility and the propensity for reflux and aspiration. Next slide. And so even in the most recent guidelines that were published in 2021, severe esophageal dysmotility and even connective tissue disease are considered risk factors, things that really need to be seriously considered in the evaluation process, um, even to this day as we've moved forward and really um, innovated. I will highlight uh, I, the other thing I'm going to be talking about today is 
uh, mycobacterium abscessus infection, which is also considered a high risk factor even in today's um, day and age. Next slide. I, I highlight the GI issues because this was one of the first patients that we transplanted um, for scleroderma. This is back in 2005. And post-op day three to four, the patient developed severe hypoxemic respiratory failure. And you can see the CT scan on the, on the right-hand side shows dense consolidations in air bronchograms in the bilateral uh, lower lobes. This is actually extended to the, to the mid-lung field. And on bronchoscopy, you can see there is sloughing of the um, mucosa of the bronchus, but more importantly, there's just frank gastric contents in the airways. And this patient had suffered an aspiration shortly after extubation and fortunately survived this episode, but um, ended up requiring a second uh, single lung transplant to uh, liberate her from the ven ventilator. So we knew that the, this, this patient population would pose risks. And um, next slide, Josine. We got some reassurance from the Johns Hopkins and Pittsburgh group at that time that showed that long-term outcomes in this patient population seemed to be equivalent to those patients who had non-scleroderma IPF and pulmonary hypertension. But you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves, the solid line representing those patients with scleroderma, the short-term outcomes were pretty um, ominous. In fact, almost 30% uh, death within the first six months. But the long-term survival um, in this particular case, co case cohort did give us hope that we could proceed. And we developed the multidisciplinary approach, working with our rheumatologists, our gastroenterologists, to really focus on the, the, the really high risk area, which in our minds is this uh, GI issues and the um, propensity for reflux and aspiration. And we really instituted behavioral modification in this group um, and studied their esophageal function and their reflux parameters carefully in the pre-transplant run-up. Um, these um, evaluation guidelines were then in, inserted actually into the, to the 2015 um, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant um, Evaluation Guidelines. Next slide. We proceeded on with this more multidisciplinary approach to evaluating these patients. And um, a, I don't know if does anyone want to click the, the button again. I think there might be a, um, there we go. Um, and we published the results of our first 23 patients that underwent transplantation for scleroderma, which showed that they had excellent both short and long-term survival. In follow-up study of this cohort, we have shown that they had equivalent, if not better, long-term survival than patients with IPF. Um, and this really um, showed us that with careful evaluation of these patients and also um, behavior modification and management of the GI illnesses, we can get these patients through transplant successfully. And, um, and and get them with good and have them uh, have good outcomes as well. Next slide. So this is that patient I showed up front who's debilitated on oxygen, um, really struggling. A uh, one year later, back to the mountain climbing. Next slide. And this has really transformed our program in some ways um, because, as I mentioned, we have such a rigorous rheumatologic and ILD clinic. Um, uh, referral base, uh, almost 13% of our patients who undergo transplant have some form of connective tissue disease, which is markedly different than both region and US. Next slide. And I'll say one more thing is uh, then since 2008, um, we've had 53 patients undergo transplantation for scleroderma related lung disease. Next, I'm going to briefly uh, tell a story about mycobacterium abscessus. Uh, back one slide, Jasmine. This is an infection, non-tuberculous mycobacterium that afflicts almost 10% of patients with CF. It's a devastating infection leading to disability, hospitalizations, early death. And unfortunately, it was also associated with a high degree of mortality and um, graft dysfunction in patients in early case series. And so it was considered to be a contraindication for transplantation at nearly 80% of transplant centers. Next slide. We knew we needed to fix this problem. Um, this was a common problem in CF. We were seeing more and more patients with it. And so again, we delved into a multidisciplinary approach, working with infectious diseases, including Brian Schwartz and Peter Chen Hong. And we developed an approach that, that included really aggressive antibiotic treatment before transplantation. We got these patients um, to have a significantly decreased burden of disease. We wanted them to have um, at least their sputums smear negative. And once they were smear negative, we enlisted them. We proceeded to transplant, and then Dr. Kukrasia and her group did a lot of um, cleanup of the pleural space with, uh, with interpleural amnicacin wash, and then we 
treated them very aggressively post-transplantation. And these were these two innovations were things that hadn't been done before, and we think really made a big difference in the outcome of these patients. Next slide. We wrote our experience up for the first um, seven patients that we did. Next slide. And um, this group of patients, most of them had cystic fibrosis or chronic rejection um, um, but with, with the underlying disease of cystic fibrosis. And they were very sick, needing oxygen, having high carbon dioxide levels, um, many of them underweight. Next slide. But we showed in this, um, in this publication that these patients did well. In fact, with a um, CF comparator group, they had equal survival um, and equal incidence of chronic rejection. We had one patient who developed a soft tissue infection with m that was um, which, which was treated successfully with antibiotics and Medihoney. And um, we also had one patient who unfortunately did not uh, survive past five months, but did not die from complications of m obsessus. Um, next slide. And when this publication came out, it actually had a lot of uh, press because, uh, again, this infection had been shown to be a contraindication at most centers. And this really provided a pathway for other centers to uh, proceed forward with this um, increasingly common infection in cystic fibrosis. Next slide. I think I'll turn it back over to Jasmine. Thank you, Steve. Um, so um, Steve has very nicely gone over the um, the how we have increased access from a medical standpoint for for transplant for our patients uh, from. The surgical standpoint, we have also tried to keep up with our medical colleagues. So we frequently, I, I'm, I'm assuming you all have heard about us talking about being in a transplant window. You could be too early or too late. But at UCSF, we don't believe in anything being too late. Uh, for us, death is by appointment only. And what do I mean by that? Because we have now the strategies to keep patients to some degree alive indefinitely. I think everybody know what ECMO stands for, but some who don't, this is what it stands for. Um, ECMO technology has evolved over time. This is how we used to do it in the early uh, 2000s. This is what it was in 1970s. And uh, this is what it is now in 2010s, the, the very last picture on the right. So the technology, the uh, technique, surgical technique have evolved and uh, the outcomes have significantly improved over the last three to four decades. ECMO can be deployed for many different reasons, depending on what um, uh, organ system needs support. It could be VA versus VB. There are different cannulation strategies for each of these patients. But the ultimate goal for these patients that we want to have is to have an awake and ambulatory patient if possible. So I'm just going to, over the next few slides, go over uh, some of these strategies very, very briefly. When we get a call, let's say, from the medical ICU for a patient who is in acute distress, the most common um, form of uh, ECMO that we deploy that you've all seen is the femoral VA ECMO. Historically, this was an issue uh, ultimately because you could not walk these patients, but now with our experience growing, we are able to have them uh, stand and even, um, um, even walk with this strategy. Now, as you can see, this is a patient with femoral VA ECMO walking uh, who was a bridge to transplant emergently listed. Um, we also have a the sports model we tried in the past, which basically was a cannulation instead of being in the groin, it is a cannulation in the neck um, and, and in the axilla. And of course, we can um, definitely get these patients to walk. This was a patient done in 2011, one of the first experiences. Uh, one of the things we noted with this strategy was that you could have some arm swelling and tingling. So we also tried this strategy for supporting patients, especially those who develop right ventricular failure through a sternotomy, as shown here, uh, cannulating the heart directly to, to support uh, heart and lungs. And of course, we can uh, get these patients to walk uh, post transplant, I mean, uh, um, post cannulation as well. And you can see this patient is not even uh, intubated. She's 100% supported on, uh, on uh, ECMO. So this is um, one of the uh, VV ECMO strategies. The ones that I've shown before were veno arterial. This is veno venous primarily for uh, lung support. Uh, this was uh, the 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 very first patient in the country that ambulated. Um, this was 
projects uh, done by my predecessor, Dr. Chuck Hoops, and really put our program for ECMO bridge, bridging uh, on, on the map in the US. So not only were we able to provide this uh, support to um, our patients, um, sorry, um, in, in, within our own hospital, but we were also, we also developed a team that we could deploy to, to go out in the, um, in the um, um, uh, community to provide support who otherwise had no, no access to care, um, uh, higher level of care. I think everybody is familiar with this case. This was actually a young kid who was transferred from Kaiser to the medical ICU at UCSF, Mike, who had come back from, from college and uh, developed flu-like symptoms and uh, soon progressed to, to a necrotizing staph infection like this. He was transferred to UCSF Medical ICU. And it was very obvious that this was not a recoverable situation. So we were asked to, to um, provide a ECMO support as a bridge to recovery only, but looking at him and his overall course, it was pretty obvious this was not gonna happen. So, so then of course, Jeff Golden, in his usual charming manner, talked us into doing listing him for transplant. And after 40 days, we did end up getting an organ for him and transplanted him. Uh, this was one of the hardest uh, explants we've done, um, but patient did well. The first thing he wanted after transplant was to eat pizza. And then after uh, discharge from the hospital, uh, he went back to college to finish, to graduate, and this is a one-year anniversary heading back to college. I each year get a text message from him uh, on Mother's Day thanking our team uh, for, for saving his life. So we've become quite uh, well-known in the lung transplant community for, for transplanting patients like this and others, very high-risk profile, actually one of the highest-risk profile, as you can see compared to the, uh, actually not only just US, but also globally. So we're not perfect. Um, so we are not able to 100% bridge these patients successfully to transplant, but it is not too shabby considering that they otherwise had uh, no survival chance of 0%, that 70% of them get successfully transplanted. And despite having the highest risk profile for these patients, our outcomes are one of the best in the world for, for uh, ECMO bridge to transplant. This shows us a survival of 97% for these patients who otherwise had 0% chance of survival. We have published several papers on this topic from our group um, uh, showing our excellent outcomes. We've also done uh, use same strategy of COVID um, for COVID ECMO bridge to transplant. We've done about 10, 10 patients um, uh, with this strategy at our institution. I think high, most high volume centers, except for one in Florida, have done about 10 to 12 such cases, and we are considered to be on one of the higher side for uh, COVID ARDS bridge to transplant. So over the years, our, as our, our experience has grown with ECMO bridge to transplant, so have our numbers uh, from 9% uh, to 13% right now. Um, the other thing, other ways we have increased access to transplant for patients is by increasing the uh, donor pool. These are some of the, the things that I will very, very briefly talk about. Um, the standard donor criteria are that, you know, young patient, perfect looking x-ray, good, good PF ratio, no smoking history, to now for our program, we have extended those criteria because these standard criteria were not based on any evidence. It was more by, by level of comfort for taking such organs when, when the lung transplant was still in an experimental stages. Now that we've gained experience, we've extended the, the uh, limits of our comfort. In our program right now, there is no upper age limit for accepting a donor. We've done transplants from donors with uh, remarkably poor looking x-rays for, for instance, this, this is last night's, exp uh, yesterday's exp um, uh, transplant. Uh, the donor's uh, CT scan looked like this, and on exam, there were some infarcts, but otherwise the donor looked good. So we did go ahead and transplant this patient yesterday morning or um, yesterday during the day. 
We've also expanded the donor pool in the sense that when we're not able to tell um, if a donor organs are good in the donor itself, then we have taken, um, sorry, we have taken the uh, organs out and, um, um, and put them on a device uh, to which oxygenate and perfuse the organs. And then we are able to assess a lot of the, the things that we were not able to assess in the donor. And we are able to even treat the uh, donor or organs in an ex vivo fashion with antibiotics, steroids, genetic uh, modeling, et cetera. So um, we are able to do things that one would never think of in the past. We are able to assess their PF ratio on this device. We can bron do bronchoscopy on the device. We can visually look at the organs. And uh, of course, we can monitor their um, um, pulmonary parameters this way. This is an example of a case where I think 105 other centers had turned this organ off or down. As you can see, the right lower lobe, this is the, uh, the trachea here, the right lower lobe uh, looked like liver, very consolidated, felt like liver, um, and uh, people turned this off or down. Uh, we put the organ on the device, and as you can see already, that uh, um, so just a being a couple of hours of being on the device, Almost uh, 60 percent of the uh, so maybe six, six, so maybe there's hope. I'm saying so, and by five hours, so the organ was back. pretty much completely okay. recruited. So as you can see, this we went from this looking okay. like this right, right here, one. and we transplanted the patient, uh, okay. and she did really well. We uh, we were part of the uh, international randomized control trial looking at ex vivo lung perfusion to standard. Uh, donor um, recovery as well as to extended donor criteria, and these were published in Lancet. Historically, the, the ischemia time for lungs has been limited to six to eight hours, so we also pushed our um, uh, boundaries on that front as well. Uh, historically, this is how far we went, but then uh, starting 2010, 2011, this is how far we are now going. We have almost doubled the, uh, the ischemia time tolerance in our program from six to eight to almost 12 hours. Um, another way we have expanded the donor pool, which we started last year. So we are almost like eight or nine months into it. We started accepting um, donors who were hepatitis C positive. Now, this is our very, very initial ex experience after six, um, uh, transplants, we reviewed our experience with our hepatologist colleagues, uh, Jennifer Price, who's been instrumental in getting our program off the ground. And now we have done as of last night, not the case that I showed you, that was during the day. Last night, we did an, our 12th uh, hepatitis C donor. Um, hence my, my uh, garb. I'm sorry I wasn't able to go home to change. Um, another thing that has been near and dear to my heart has been uh, hypotherm organ preservation in terms of temperature. We started with first normothermia, then we moved to four degrees centigrade, but now eight to 10 degree is uh, in vogue these days. Um, this is how we preserve organs. We kept them cool theoretically at four degrees centigrade, and uh, then uh, this al allowed us to have a total of about six to eight hour ischemia time. Uh, but what we have seen is that when we put the organs on ice, the temperature actually reaches almost freezing temperature, not the four degree that we thought. And this is shown in the thermal imaging. As you can see here, this is ice, what it looks like. And it's at a minus three degree temperature, not four degree, that when you have organs on ice, there's one in a homogeneous cooling of the lung and two there are areas of lungs that are frozen. So that cannot possibly be good for the organs. So the, this company then developed a new uh, cooling device that maintains the temperature between four to eight degrees centigrade consistently up to 40, 40 hours and even longer. And organs preserved even up to 12 hours on this device are, have very, very uniform cooling. And the temperature truly is closer to what we want it to be. So we started getting um, organs preserved this way since 2021 when it got F this device got FDA approval. We've done about 120 cases. This has allowed us to do not only long distance recoveries, but also time shifting. Um, 
I will talk very, very briefly about time shifting a, a little bit later. Now, all I've talked about is a four degree and four to eight degree. There's new evidence now suggesting that, you know, cooling the organs to about 10 degree may be even better. So this is a paper published by the Toronto group in conjunction with uh, Spain and Vienna. They did a prospective study where they preserved the organ at 10 degrees centigrade, and they showed that uh, uh, there is no difference in the intervention arm, the 10 degree arm versus the control arm uh, in terms of uh, survival. The, these are the preservation characteristics. As you can see, the preservation times is much, much longer than the six to eight degrees that had been historically the accepted norm. And basically there was no difference in, in outcomes, both the short term as well as the long-term outcome in the group that had a 10 degree centigrade preservation compared to the so-called four degree centigrade preservation. And so what we think that in our community that this probably is gonna become the gold standard for several reasons. I think it's um, able to extend the, uh, the ischemia time. It's good for the organs because there's a lot of science that has been put behind it in the sense that it has been shown in studies that the, the mitochondrial health is much better at this temperature. Uh, it's good for the recipients and good for the surgeons. Now, why is it good for the surgeons? So I mentioned this concept of time shifting. What does that mean? So historically, as you know, we are very limited in terms of um, time between organ recovery and organ transplant. And this could not be, uh, it was a pretty rigid time set because of the six to eight hours. But now with the, the, the 10 degree, I think we have more flexibility in the sense that, um, in the sense that we can recover the organs, put them on this device or, or the new transport device that is at 10 degrees centigrade, and we can leave them sitting overnight in this device and come in the next morning to do the transplant. And what studies have shown now, as I showed you in the New England Journal of Medicine paper, as well as uh, uh, some of the, uh, the papers from, from Europe, that organs can be saved or, or preserved in this device for up to even 24 hours. Um, we did one of our first time shifted cases uh, last month and it went very well, patient did great. He was extubated within 24 hours. And this I think is how the surgeons feel now that we can operate during daytime, just like the rest of us. Um, so, and, and regardless of all the boundaries that we have pushed, I think it all boils down to outcomes. Are we compromising our outcomes? Certainly not. As you can see, our 30 day survival is at 100%, which is significantly better than expected, uh, both at the national and at the regional level. Steve. Incredible. Thanks, Jesleen. Um, I was going to start off by saying, you know, the easy part is all this surgical and then the hard part is the post transplant management but after hearing uh uh Jasmine's last 24 hours i have to change my um my tune so um as Jasmine mentioned she did two transplants just within the last i think 12 to 14 hours so thank you for uh being here and uh, and for all you do so what i was going to spend uh, about 10 to 15 minutes you know rounding out is is how do we take care of these transplant patients and how do we hope to take care of them in the future what I would say that one of the things that we've been very successful at is developing systems of care that take very excellent care of patients long-term, but it is intensive. And it's not only intensive for us, it's very intensive for the patients. We have a regimented program where we're seeing patients three, four, five, six months in person, eight months, 10 months, 12 months in person with spirometry and monthly labs at infinitum. Um, we have standard protocols that we follow uh, for both immunosuppression and prophylaxis. But these protocols and everything that we're doing is really not specific to a patient or patient's experience. It's not personalized and it's not precision medicine. So we're really looking at um, ways to iterate this in the future that make things a bit more specific to patients and hopefully decrease the burden for them. Next slide. 
So what, what our priorities are for the long-term care is to really innovate the care delivery in the outpatient setting so that we continue to have a high touch care experience, but low patient burden experience. And, and we're gonna do this by building out uh, more virtual care, um, by harnessing um, data and data visualization strategies to identify opportunities and track progress. We've already instituted some remote and we're getting ready to start a study looking at biomarker monitoring. So we can take care of patients at more of a distance, but still in a very vigorous and rigorous way. And then eventually we're hoping to incorporate more AI into care delivery. Um, I'm not saying that we're gonna have chat GTP take over our jobs, but um, we hope to incorporate some machine learning so that we can improve the speed and the efficiency with which we do our care. Next slide. And so in the future, um, transplant care may look a bit different. Um, perhaps our follow-up clinic visits will be more personalized and not necessarily as regimented the home lab. We can potentially do home lab testing, which would prevent patients from having to come into the lab all the time. Uh, more vigorous home surveillance, um, biomarker testing, so that overall the care just becomes much more personalized. And we're using things like pharmacogenomics to make decisions as opposed to just using a standardized protocol for both immunosuppression and prophylaxis. Next slide. One of the projects that we um, we we uh, developed over these last two to three years relates to home monitoring of lung function in patients uh, with lung transplants. And part of this was instigated by COVID and, and the fact that our spirometry labs were, were shut down. But part of it is something we've been wanting to do for many years. And that's to more carefully monitor patients at home, but potentially also um, decrease the burden of care on the patients. And we did this through the use of uh, Bluetooth enabled home spirometers. So these spirometers that communicate with a simple device such as a phone or an iPad. And then we linked this to a um, chatbot that we developed um, with the CDHI. And this chatbot would engage with patients through a chat interface and then would uh, send them messages uh, such as, you know, it's time to measure your lung function. And then that um, patients would enter that data and engage with the chatbot and that data would go into the cloud or it can be analyzed and it would provide feedback to the patient. So if the patient's lung function declined or there was some other concerning symptom that was um, entered into the chat, the patients would then get a message from uh, the chatbot. But um, as importantly, it would send us a message through the EHR that something was going on with the lung function of the patient or they had a concerning symptom. So we would get this feedback and be able to um, find a disposition and, and engage with the patient to um, develop a care plan. Next next slide. And this is some just some, some uh, screenshots of, of the experience. On the left is a screen grab of the chatbot experience for the patient. So you can tell it's kind of iterative. Patients are answering questions and it's um, the feedback is very dependent on the data that the patient's entering. And then the other um, graphic shows the report that the physicians can see in the patient in the in the clinic for patient entered FEV once. And there, you know, you can see here clearly this patient had an FEV one that seemed stable for a while, that, but then had a decline. This is important information. And the other thing that's interest that's useful is that we are able to collect it on a much more frequent basis than we would with lab spirometry, which we may be able to collect that um, once a month at the most. In this case, we could collect home spirometry every day. We're asking patients to check it about uh, once per week. Next slide. And then as I mentioned, um, we do receive alerts when there's changes in home spirometry that are detected. We have algorithms that analyze the, the baseline FEV1 and then where there's changes, we get alerts into our EMR. Next slide. And then we're able to send patients messages directly from the AMR, uh, giving them a disposition for what to do next. In some cases, we'll have them just repeat their spirometry uh, for three more days. Other cases, we'll have um, arranged for them to have a telehealth visit or come on site for in lab spirometry. Next slide. And this has really enabled us to um, more fully launch a, a robust telehealth um, monitoring system for our patients. As I mentioned on the first few slides, our patients were very accustomed to coming in, traveling several hours to get their care here at UCSF. And now we've transitioned to a lot of uh, a lot more telehealth. Um, and we were able to combine that with the home spirometer. It gives us a very um, more rigorous, I think, telehealth experience for both the practitioners and for the patients. We really can see what's going on with the lung function when we're seeing these patients remotely. Next slide. 
And some of our first experience um, with the home spirometry program shows uh, several findings. Uh, we actually just published our, um, our findings in the journal of heart and lung transplant a couple of months ago. What we found is that patients um, had very high adherence rate and uh, most patients, or well, the average number of submissions per month was over four, which is what we're asking patients to do, which is once per week. Um, we were able to reduce the on-site or in-person visits by 35% in the first two years. And this gave patients a real cost savings estimated to be over $1,100. Um, over the course of the two years, it was almost $200,000 of patient cost savings for travel expenses and, and that kind of thing. And um, with the program, just in the first two years, we were able to pick up cases of CLAD, which is chronic lung allograft dysfunction, chronic rejection, or CLAD progression um, before they would have been picked up um, by lab spirometry. And I think what's reassuring is that despite having incorporated much more remote care monitoring in these patients and more virtual care, we have not seen a dramatic change in healthcare utilization. We're still really looking at this data, but our, on first pass, we haven't seen an increase or a change in hospitalization rates in the first year, nor a change in the number of CT acquisitions or bronchoscopy acquisitions. Next slide. So I wanted to kind of round up our work in really looking at data and data visualization to help us un to understand what's going on with the program, to identify potential gaps in care, and also to plan for the future. Um, I showed this graphic, this comes from a, um, a New York Times editorial written by a patient who has a heart transplant, and she's actually had two and lived for 35 years with these, but was dying of metastatic cancer. And the point of her editorial was to say that, you know, as transplant community, we've been very focused on preserving graft function and, um, and, and really most of the, the, the innovation and the technology is around trying to treat rejection. But what we have not done as good a job about is personalizing our care so that we avoid chronic complications and in her case, cancer. Next slide. So this is an effort, and, and I, Aida Venata, who is um, a quality champion in our division, um, and she's been working with us in developing uh, quality strategies in our lung transplant group. She's a lung transplant pulmonologist, has come up with quilt metrics, which are essentially um, part of a, a data visualization effort to really understand the chronic complications of lung transplantation. If we can really get a handle on uh, the frequency of these complications and really able to see the trends in these complications that we can we can actually make changes um, and if we can avoid some of these complications i think we'll have improved survival and quality of life for our patients next slide so some of the things that we've identified as um, as things we're going to look at uh, first re revolve around the kidney function so we're tracking incidents of acute uh, kidney injury as well as chronic kidney uh, disease in our patients and we're able to sort of graph this out over time so we can see whether our trends um, increasing or decreasing episodes of acute uh, kidney injury and or CKD. And what we've known, what we've found on, and really looking at this data is that the incidence of AKI is, is common. And, um, and the other thing that is, that we also know is that CKD occurs in about 30% of patients after the first year. So this is definitely something that's worthy of looking more closely at, and I think, as a as a quality um, a quality improvement coach myself, you know you, you can't change it if you if you can't measure it. So this is a really important uh, step forward. Next slide. We're also looking at the effects of our medications on bone marrow and specifically leukopenia and diabetes. And next slide, Jesling. And finally, we're also developing really robust um, transplant metric dashboards, which are looking at all aspects of the transplant program. Um, we are um, wanting to, to be able to visualize quickly not only our transplant rates, but also our waitlist management. We have a particular interest in looking at, um, you know, how our waitlist um, management is, is impacted by um, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And so those are sort of built into some of the metrics that we're looking at. Um, and so we're really hoping that with a much more vigorous look at the data that's coming out of our program and, and in specific patients, they were able to then make improvements on these areas and get the, the survival and the outcomes of the patients overall trending, continuing to trend positive. Next slide. And um, this is just to kind of summarize, I think this is what Jasleen and I presented today um, 
really just represents, I think, a fraction of all the things that we've done over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. I think what's reassuring is that when we look at it from a very um, sort of overall global perspective, patients are doing better. And I think when Jesse and I both started in this business, um, patients would always come into the clinic and say, so if I get a transplant, I've got about five years to live. And that is fortunately not even close to the reality um, for patients so where their median survival now is close to 11 years. And I think what this graphic shows is that we've made sort of steady improvements in both our surgical perioperative techniques, our medical follow-up techniques and innovations that have really pushed the, the boundaries of what we can do with lung transplantation. Um, I, I think uh, I definitely want Jesleen to contribute, but my, um, I guess, uh, sense of satisfaction with this is that I think now we can tell lung transplant patients if they're going to get transplant, they have just as much opportunity to have a great outcome as if they were getting a heart transplant, a liver transplant, or a kidney. And that is actually saying a lot, <laughs> I think. So um, I'll let Jesleen say some closing comments, but thank you again for the time and opportunity to share what we're doing. So this is the reason why we do this. Thank you very much, Steve. I mean, there's been a lot of um, um, you know effort uh, put in our program to to improve um, access, quality, et cetera. I think one of the key things when Steve and I took over the program was uh, we weren't so much about the numbers and we were more focused on the quality of care for the the patients and their outcomes. but but as you say, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, I think um, as, as uh, we showed the community that we can produce the outcomes that Steve just outlined, you know, 11 year median survival, I mean, they just come, right? So, so we have become a very, very dominant figure in, in lung transplant in the country. Actually, I would say actually in the, in the, in the world. And we've now hosted several visiting scholars from different countries to, to spend time with us, to learn our, our techniques and our methods and, and our approach to patient care. And it's been a very, very remarkable journey. And I am so thankful to Steve and the rest of the pulmonary group for, for such a beautiful collaboration we've had over the years and Bob for um, inviting us to, to share our experience today. You know, as I think it was Mark Twain who said, um, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one. Um, so I know we presented a lot of data, but this is really a fraction of uh, uh, what we have done. So thank you again all for, for giving us the opportunity to share with you our uh, uh, outcomes in our lung transplant program at UCSF. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of information and actually unbelievably inspiring. I really appreciate it. Uh, Jasmine, you should know that uh, John Carter's slides were more gross than yours of, of GI procedures. So appreciate the trigger warning. We were, I think we're, we're okay now. Uh, maybe take down the slides and we'll go ahead and uh, do some Q&A. If you have questions, please go ahead and post them. Uh, I'm sure this could be its own talk, but can somebody just do a one minute on management of COPD and when you decide that you need a transplant versus lung reduction surgery for someone with end-stage emphysema, for example? I'm happy to fill that with Jesleen. Um, good question, Bob. So it's something we, um, you know, I think over time, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, but the number of patients that we transplant for COPD has just gone down and down and down. And that's uh, because I think in general, from a pulmonary perspective, we're probably doing a bit better job um, taking care of them in their latter stages. But because we've also realized that, um, you know, the outcomes or the survival of, of patients with COPD after transplant isn't generally that much better than if they weren't to get a transplant. That's the one category of patients that um, can live a long time with really poor lung function. Um, so when we're going down the decision tree about whether to pursue transplant or lung volume reduction, essentially um, when patients are getting into that window where we start thinking about it, which is where they have high oxygen needs um, and their quality of life is, is, is not good and they're having exacerbations with hospitalizations, um, I think that the things that um, would tip us towards lung volume reduction is if they still had a reasonable exercise capacity, 
um, but they had a poor quality of life and they didn't have some of the significant risk factors for death, which would include pulmonary hypertension, severe hypercapnia, um, and then uh, sort of purulent or, or um, the more chronic bronchitic symptoms with frequent exacerbations uh, associated with hypercapnic respiratory failure. Those types of things would then steer us more towards transplant because those types of risk factors um, patients don't do as well with lung volume reduction, if that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, Jesley, I'm, I'm struck by the distance you showed on the map of where you're getting organs from. First of all, do you guys do the explant when it's sort of, you know, four hour flight away? And second of all, uh, just how does that work that there's an organ available somewhere in the Midwest or the East Coast and that they must be flying over 10 transplant centers to get here? So how does it end up here? Right, so so there's a new organ allocation system now developed, um, uh, and it was deployed in March of this year, where geography is not so much of an issue as it is a medical urgency. So so getting over those geographic boundaries, we are able to accomplish that. As I showed you before uh, on that map, that initially we were kind of focused on the west coast, right? But but to be honest, we were going as far as Hawaii, although it was very, very selective, right? So uh, obviously we were flying, we are still flying private jets, uh, you know, and going all over the country in the middle of the night. But uh, I didn't show for in the interest of time, our uh, recent case of uh, now we're trying to do these uh, uh, taking commercial flights with the availability of the 10 degree centigrade and the ability to keep the organs uh, viable for longer than the, the traditional six to eight hours. We're hoping to, to reduce the, the cost of doing business to some degree, so to speak. So, and it, but it's, it's, it's you and your, you mentioned you have two or two and a half transplants. Yes. Uh, so so those the are the point. implanting. Yes. Those are yeah. the implanting surgeons. And uh, we have uh, a couple of surgeons that are, um, um, we contract with to do our organ recovery. So yes. they, they are, they're going um, around the country getting organs for us. And of course, we also from time to time go get, get them as well. Now that we are uh, a 80 plus, uh, you know, program volume, we're not going out as often because we're on the, uh, the ho at home, you know, receiving organs now. We don't have enough time to do both. Uh, by the way, I'm in a conference room in Genentech Hall and the lights seem to have just gone out. So that's uh, why it's got very spooky here. Um, you mentioned that uh, the bridge deck of ECMO bridging to transplant about 70% make it, 30% don't. What happens to the, that 30% and how long can someone stay on ECMO? Very good questions. Uh, so the 30% are the ones that have 0% survival to begin with. So they don't make it, unfortunately. And this is the hard part of our job, obviously, that you know we know ahead of time. And even after 20 years of doing this, it's very, very, very difficult for each and every person involved in the care of the patient when we have a bridge to, as we say, nowhere. Uh, so we end up instituting uh, hospice care in those patients. Um, and what was your second question, Bob? Uh, how, how long could, what's sort of the max? Is oh, there something? Very, okay. So the longest we, the longest we have done is about three months. But I do know that some, uh, some I, I think it was on the Midwest, um, there was one program that took a COVID ARDS patient for seven months hmm. and wow. did transplant. Yeah. And I guess while we're on the COVID ARDS topic, it seems relatively straightforward if you have bad interstitial lung disease not responding to therapy or scleroderma. There are tons of patients who have sepsis and then ARDS and are not getting better, but all of us have seen them turn around in a month or two. So how do you make the call when it's ARDS and I guess there's some level of uncertainty in terms of prognosis? Steve, you want to try that? Sure, and I, and I definitely want Jasmine to, to contribute. So this is, I think, one of the biggest things we struggled with when we first started thinking about COVID ARDS patients for transplant because we were getting referrals. And fortunately, there was some programs that had some experience, and then um, you know, groups of, in both Toronto and Chicago pushed out their experience. And I think ultimately, um, what we wanted to do was demonstrate that they had made it through this sort of fire. Like we weren't going to be transplanting someone who had 
sort of acute ARDS um, and maybe still viral positive, viral load positive and PCR positive, they needed to kind of um, get through that sort of burn phase, which may be in the first two to three weeks after the infection. And then we wanted to see, um, we really weren't considering patients in the first six weeks, you know, four to six weeks after the initial infection. We wanted to um, support the patients. And even after we may be considering them for transplant, we would still continue to support them to see if they had any incremental improvements. And then we would, um, if they were showing us that they were getting improvements, we would just continue to support them. So um, I would say, you know, Jesley showed the, the graphic of, the, um, of the patients that we transplanted. And most patients had been on life support for three to four months before we considered transplantation. Um, and they often had radiographic evidence of non-recoverable um, lungs. And that means cavities and fibrosis, which don't resolve you know, with time. Jasmine, what other comments would you have about that? I think this is the biggest debate in the community for these patients in terms of timing of transplant. Nobody really knows. A lot of uh, studies, a lot of pe people talking about it. There, you know, some of the early transplants were done way too early, in my opinion. I think now there's consensus that you got to wait at least six to eight weeks to, to see if there's been any recovery or not. And as Steve mentioned, some of these patients that were referred to us, uh, had been at the uh, at their parent institution for several months on this before we considered taking them. One mm -hmm. of the the issue, not just with COVID ARDS but ARDS in general, is that you know when you do emergency transplants, this is the other aspect that's somewhat uncertain in this patient population is that you know we have no rapport with these patients, right? We don't know if they're compliant, how they're going to behave, you know, psychologically, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a leap of faith for us, right? And we certainly have paid the price for it. So we're very, very selective when it comes to these acute, uh, acutely ill patients without underlying chronic lung disease in the past. So, and is there anything different? In your experience with COVID ARDS versus, or are you thinking about it the same way if someone comes in with sepsis, uh, you know, bacterial sepsis and has subsequent ARDS? It's about the same. There's no no significant difference. You just need to make sure that uh, they have, um, you know, organ, other organ systems are working. It's a single system organ failure and uh, and it's an irreversible situation. Those are probably the hallmarks, but, but for this patient population, I think what is not as highlighted as, as it should be is the psychosocial component of it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is not uh, uh, very well acknowledged. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you, you, you I, I thought the part where you talked, uh, an exciting development is sort of thinking about long-term consequences of all the immunosuppression and all that. Do you think 10 years from now, we'll be using different immunosuppressants or the same ones at lower doses or somehow be able to target doses based on some sort of genetic or phenotypic profile that tells us more precisely who needs what? I, yes, I, I think both um, affirmative. We will probably have new immunosuppression strategies. I mean, it's remarkable that we've gone really 40 years without anything majorly new. I mean, we've got some different versions of cyclosporin and different versions of rapimune, but um, our immunosuppression strategy hasn't changed much. I think what we have as, as low hanging fruit is really understanding um, the pharmacogenomics of certain patients and how they're metabolizing therapies and being able to target um, immunosuppression in a much more specific way, as opposed to this sort of, um, sort of gross target levels that we shoot for now. Um, I also think that we're going to be able to factor in all these other, which we, you know, I think we have the tools now to start doing this, but looking at things that we know are risk factors for complications, such as age and these other, um, you know, very um, superficial uh, risk factors that we're not really incorporating into our immunosuppressive strategy. So I think we're going to have both new medications that um, we're already starting to get accustomed to some of biologics and then We'll also have new strategies, probably utilizing AI and, and other pharmacogenomic information to better take care of patients um, in the next 10 years. I, yeah, I also wondered, sort of syncing up the two parts of your final presentation, whether <clears throat> the ability to monitor patients so much more closely and in real time allows you to try 
sort of lower doses, knowing that if they begin to show uh, evidence of under immunosuppression, you can go ahead and do that much more quickly. Absolutely, we are we are going we're starting a trial in in, in the next month, actually looking at a specific biomarker that shows us whether there's been any lung uh, or organ injury, and you know it's not clear if it's sensitive enough to you know to allow us to make immunosuppression changes like you're suggesting, but that is one of the ideas that we've had. Can we use that as a marker to show when is when can how low can we get this? Because that ultimately is um, what we need is we need a biomarker that that allows us to better gauge our immunosuppression. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are at time. Thank you both for not only a great presentation, but for an amazing amount of uh, extraordinary work over the last 20 years. And I understand that you two are standing in for a very large uh, team that does all of this, uh, I think, as a, the role models for a lot of our other services in terms of the level of collaboration. So we are really grateful and uh, uh, appreciate you doing this. And next week, I will be talking to Lindsay Criswell, our former colleague who now runs the National Institute of Musculoskeletal Disease and Arthritis uh, for a fireside chat. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody.